Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our EDL seminar and uh, environmental disaster prevention seminars today. I'm very <coughs> great honor to welcome Professor Deepak Gawali from uh, visiting professor of United Nations Universities. Uh, before he's talking, I would like to introduce him briefly. Okay. So Professor Deepak Gawali is an academician of the Nepal Academy of Science and Technology and research director of nonprofit Nepal Water Conservation Foundations. He is a hydroelectric power engineer uh, as well as political economist study in resources use. Okay. He has served as Nepal's Minister of Water Resources. He is responsible for power, irrigation, and flood control between November 2002 and May 2003. In that position, he initiated reforms in the electricity and irrigation sectors focusing on decentralization and promotion of rural say in governance. He is a board member of Nepal Water for Health, one of the largest technical NGOs in Nepal that has provided clean drinking water and sanitation services to over a million poor villages in rural Nepal, as well as an advisor to Na National Association of Community Electric Users of Nepal, National Federation of Irrigation Water Uses Association Nepal. He's a life member of the Society of Electrical Engineers Nepal, as well as Nepal Engineer Associations. Also, he has served in the past as a member of the International Advisory Board of Oxford University's James Martin Institute for Science and Civilizations, chaired the South Asia Regional Advisory Panel of the, so of the Social Science Research Council of New York. Recently, in 2006, he chaired the international EU panel that reviewed 12 years of the international water research cooperation of the European Union across the globe. Also, he was uh, independent external evaluation committee for UNESCO and the Dutch government 2007, which reviewed institutional arrangements of the UNESCO IHE Institute for Water Education at Delft, Netherlands. Currently, he is the vice chair of the Technical Advisory Committee of UN UNESCO for its World Water Development Report and the co-chair of the Policy Relevance Subgroup. And today, he is talking on uh, water cultural pluralism and global environmental challenges. So please, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what I plan to do with you today is to talk to you about elegant failures and clumsy successes. It's a contradiction. You think that successes are elegant and failures would be clumsy. But we find out that in the environmental field, in the water field, it is just the opposite. And with that, I would like to talk to you about the kind of social science that I do, which is called cultural theory, which allows us to examine these elegant failures and clumsy successes, provide better insights and thus, hopefully, be able to devise more successful and robust policies. We have seen too many policy failures in the environmental arena. So this is what I hope to do. I'd like to start with this picture for you today. It's a picture out of Pakistan, the study we were doing. But I thought the study, because most of you are going to be environmental diplomats, and diplomats have to cross boundaries and live in strange places and, and do strange things. Now, you look at this woman in a society like Pakistan. Obviously, she is the boss. She is selling strawberries 
a very unusual product, a new product in Pakistan. Most people don't eat strawberries. Strawberry is a new product for us, exotic fruit. Comes with ice cream, I guess. And she is selling that on a donkey cart, but using a mobile phone. Look at the technology boundaries she has crossed. Look at the boundaries she has crossed from probably where she comes growing these things, which is in the informal economy, which is not registered anywhere. Governments have no accounts of it. And she's selling that in an urban area. Even the background behind tells you a lot. These are old Mughal ruins, and you see high-tension electrical wires. Now, this is the world of contradictions that we all live in. And much of the environmental negotiations that we have to do to get a successful environmental treaty has to be within an entire realm of contradictions. This is what I wish to impress upon you. Now, hopefully, you know, I'm just putting this down in sentences, elegant failures and clumsy successes. That's the key word I use. Seen through the lens of cultural theory, with its conceptual pluralism. Now, this is important to highlight. Too often in policy making over the last half century, we have seen monism and at times dualism. What do I mean? Initially, all development was thought of as something done by the government. In third world countries, all kinds of donors provided supports to governments and things like that. Around the 1980s and 1990s, most donors became fed up and started saying, no, no, governments can't do it. They haven't done it well. And there was a wild pendulum swing to the other extreme. Let the market do it. It's called the Washington Consensus. The problem is, we think that this dualism, the monism, neither the market alone nor the government alone, and as we argue as cultural theorists, not even just governments and markets can do it right. You need something more, you know. Because most environmental problems or water problems are what we call wicked problems. What are wicked problems? These are problems that you cannot even properly define. You have a package of problem, you unpack it, and lo and behold, inside, take urban water, for instance, shortage. Take an environmental problem you have, climate change, for instance. You know, any one of these intractable problems are wicked problems. You unpack them, and you thought you unpacked them, but inside you will probably find even more complicated problems each. Urban water is a classic example. You think it's a problem of water shortage, and then you suddenly find out it is a problem of water rights, it's a problem of sociology, it's a problem of law, it's a problem of economics, it's a problem of many, many things. Each one worse than the other. This is what is called a wicked problem. The trouble with wicked problems is that conventional knowledge will not probably provide you answers. Because conventional knowledge probably got us into the mess in the first place. So you have to look for what is called uncomfortable knowledge. Knowledge that is probably not out there, even if out there is probably not accepted as registered and formal by many people. And that kind of knowledge will help you provide what we call sometimes clumsy solutions. I like to call them many 10% solutions. And I'll tell you why as we go along. I'll talk to you first about something in Nepal itself. It's called uh, an elegant failure. An elegant failure is a treaty between Nepal and India done in 1976. It's called the Mahakali Treaty. If you look at Nepal over there, as don't have a pointer, but just where those red lines start, just on top there, is the western boundary of Nepal. And the western boundary of Nepal is formed by a river called Mahakali in Nepal and Sarda in India. Our problem is that rivers change names as you go along, and they can have different names on different sides of the river. This Mahakali Treaty was done between Nepal and India in 1996. And what this treaty proposed to do, it was signed between Nepal and India. Nepal, in Nepal, it was ratified by two-thirds majority of the parliament, consisting of communists and socialists and just about everybody else. There was very small opposition within the parliament. Only 20 members walked out at that point. 
Now the treaty envisaged building one of the highest rock filled dams in the Himalaya on this river at a place called Pancheshwar to, to build 6480 megawatts of power. It's a huge dam. It would be one of the largest high dams in the world. It happens to be just 150 kilometers due east of that other controversial dam in India called the Tehri. But this is much bigger than Tehri. Okay. Now what this dam would do is besides providing so much electricity, it would provide stored water, water that would be stored in the monsoon and released because much of India and Nepal, you should remember, is what is called a semi-arid zone. It's a zone where there is four months of flood and eight months of absolute drought with not a drop of rain sometimes. So there is a need for water. There is water scarcity during these eight months. And one of the obvious technologies is to dam the Himalayan rivers and provide that, store the monsoon flow and provide it during the dry season. Obvious logic to it. This is where things begin to unravel. When you build that dam and you have regulated water, the problem with multipurpose projects is that they are like a factory. Think of it as a factory that produces several items, not just one item. This factory of high dam produces electricity. It produces regulated water that gives you irrigation in the dry season that allows you to produce a second and third crop. It provides you regulated water that provides flood control and your railway lines and bridges are not washed away. It provides better navigation because the river level is up. It provides for better fisheries, aquaculture, and, and tourism, and so on and so forth. This one factory has to provide all that, and all these products have to pay for it. The trouble starts here. The way Nepali and Indian politics is organized, especially Indian politics, Indian farmers don't want to pay for that water. They want it free. And every Indian election, a slogan is in Hindi, I mean, some of you know Hindi, this is Kisan ko pani aur bizli muft milega. That is the slogan from every political party that farmers will get free electricity and water. And that's how they get elected. Now, when this becomes a transboundary issue, dams have to be built in Nepal. It's a border river, all right, but still there's a significant part of Nepal that will be drowned by the dam. Lots of villages, lots of uh, farmland. Then it, the question comes up, you know, why would a Nepali village, villager like to be drowned just so that an Indian villager gets free water and electricity. Now, this starts complicating a lot of things. This is just the start. Then there are many other problems come, that come up, environmental issues, you know, social, you know, all these issues. So what you see in this jagged line below, the, the hatched part, are the irrigation command of that dam. And uh, it's too small to see, but if you really looked at it, what you would see is it's a huge area. And this area, forget the other places it irrigates, it irrigates the constituencies of six past Indian Prime Ministers plus the current chairperson of the Congress party, Sonia Gandhi, and the whole lot. Now this is powerful constituencies and therefore the pressure on Nepal is very high. Now why having governments having signed these kind of treaties, why is it an elegant failure? Well elegant because you know you had all this wonderful treaty. Failure because the treaty envisaged in 1996 when it was passed that in six months the detailed design of the dam would be done, in two years the financing would be done, and in eight years the dam itself would be built. It has been 14 years now, and not even that detailed design that should have been done in six months has been done. So when a work that's supposed to have been done, written in the treaty, in six months, cannot be done in 14 years, you obviously know that those who designed the treaty forgot some important considerations, considerations that have bedeviled this treaty and it has practically become dead. Now, so this is an example that I would cite if you were, for instance, as you graduate out of this place and you become a diplomat, an environmental diplomat for, let's say, a major international funding agency that wants to fund this dam, what do you do? What would you advise? Well, your first problem is going to be, what is the problem? And you suddenly find out that the problem is a wicked problem. It has got many, many other problems inside that just have not been addressed. Second. 
there are different social groupings that have different views on what the problem is. They don't even agree on the definition of the problem. Now, if people do not agree on the definition of what the problem is, you can bet your boots that the solutions they are going to offer is going to be even more different. This is called an impasse, a terrific impasse. Now, this is what environmental diplomats would be expected to be able to sort out. How you might do that, I will come to with further examples. I'll give you another elegant failure. Much has been written about it, if you want. There was a project in Nepal pushed by the World Bank and seven donors, including the government of Japan, to build this project called Arun 3. Now, by any international standard, it's not a big project. It's just a 400, well, then 201 uh, megawatt project in a remote area. And the government was all set to go. Seven donors were all set to go. They spent $20 million just studying the project. Huge amount of money, you would say. But what happened with all that $20 million study? It seems they had missed some very crucial points, which a bunch of environmentalists, a bunch of social activists, just got together and brought out eight newsletters, and the project collapsed. The World Bank had to withdraw in 1995 from this project. Now, yes, it's a failure, amazing failure at an international kind of a level. Why did that happen? Because what the activists brought out was not so much environmental issues, because there is really not much there. There's not much uh, technical issues either, or social issues. There is no resettlement for a dam, which is a huge benefit to a dam, if you ask me. If there's no resettlement, there's nobody lives up there. The problem was economics. Somehow, even an organization like the World Bank failed to see that you cannot build a project at $5,000 plus, $5,400 per kilowatt, when the market was building projects at about a fourth of that rate. This is what the activists got wise to. And on behalf of the consumers, they said the consumers don't need to pay for a project that is four times more expensive than what the market can hold. And the bank collapsed. It had no answer. It fought back, but it could not. You can see the numbers. The result of which is, all this, is that the monies allocated to this project were used in several other projects, plus other money came in from the private sector, plus some Nepali entrepreneurs also put in some money. And together, after the collapse of this one big project, six smaller alternative projects were built, have already been built, and they provide a third more electricity at half the cost, half the time. One would say, you don't need to have an Excel sheet to see which one is better. But this would not have happened had that environmental social activism not come in place, because the governments and the donors and everybody was agreed that they were going to go ahead with Arun 3. And it was cancelled only at the last minute. Now, these are elegant failures, as I would call them. Now, before we come to the theory part, I will just have two examples of solutions that I will talk about much later in one of them, but one I'd like to talk to you right about of clumsy solutions where international negotiation on water and handling water problem has actually succeeded. And you will see that it has succeeded not because there was some neat optimized answer put forward that everybody accepted. No, there was tremendous fights, but it worked. What is it? My first example is the cleanup of the Rhine. You know that the Rhine River the six countries, major countries of Europe involved in it, uh, basically Switzerland, France, Germany, Netherlands, and then you have, I think, Luxembourg or something. You know, these countries are involved in it. The Rhine passes through the heartland of Europe. It's the industrial, it was the industrial heartland of the world, actually, to tell you the truth. Okay. And so the river was polluted, very polluted. Uh, in fact, it got the name the sewer of Europe. By 1946, it was so bad, so bad, that the Dutch, the poor Dutch, like the Bangladeshis in, 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 in the Ganges in South Asia, the Dutch who live right at the end of that river, turned out to be the, the ones who received all the muck from uh, the top. So they took a lead. And they 
worked at it, and by 1950, an international commission had been set up for, for the protection of the Rhine, and it became official in 1963. So it's a big governmental, intergovernmental commission, you know, to set up to clean up the Rhine. Very slowly it moved. Even though the thing started in 46, was mooted in 50, 1950, by 1963 it was official. The first agreement only came about in 1976. It was a very weak two conventions to say that we will stop chemical pollution and, and, and chlorides. Okay. The trouble was even with the, with the convention in 1976, nothing was going on. Governments were sitting on negotiations, fighting, nothing happened, nothing moved, you know. And it uh, got so bad that in 1979, unusual in Europe, post-war Europe, the Dutch government had to recall its ambassador from France in protest because some French company was dumping chloride into the river and the, the government, French government was not doing anything about it. I mean, it got that bad that you had an international commission, but the F Dutch government had to withdraw their ambassador from France. It was that bad. Okay. Then what happened? Now, generally, you know, it's always a crisis that stimulates new thinking and provides windows of opportunity, which is why in disaster, those of us who work advocating alternative views of disaster argue that disasters are unfinished businesses of development. It's a disaster is, is it's not a nice thing to say publicly, but it's an opportunity to see if you can force the system to work differently, better, and more resilient. That's what's important. So similarly here, there was a disaster. In 1986, November 1, Sandoz factory in Basel had a massive chemical spill. You know, the, like you, the one you saw in Hungary recently, yeah, but it was much worse. It was massive fish kill along the Rhine for the, what little fish was left. You know, complete destruction, huge environmental protest. Okay. Now, what happened? This was a disaster, all right. The international panel was not doing anything. I mean, they were there, they were talking about it, nothing happened. Now, this is what's interesting. There was a Dutch minister of transport called Neely Kroes, and she did something unusual. She did not wait for the International Commission to come out with a solution or do something, you know. She took a very individualistic decision by herself. First thing she did was she hired international consultant, to, a very good one, to give advice, okay. And this, this group gave a report very quickly, and it asked for four things. I mean, it was negotiated. The bottom line was, first it said, intergovernmental agreements should be informal and non-binding. Now, this is not generally accepted in international treaty making, either in Kyoto Protocol or any one of these climate things, you know. They want to say, let's have binding protocol. They said, no, no, don't do that. Have agreements, but have them informal and non-binding at the international level. Okay. Second, it said, do not conclude formal treaties. Because people who start arguing over full stop and comma and no work gets actually done. Okay, I said, don't conclude. Third thing is said, make sure that the responsibility for getting things done goes to the lowest level of government. The cantons, or what in Japan would be prefectures, I guess, you know, the Swiss cantons, the German landers, you know, way down there, the local government. Huh? And finally it said, at the governmental level, have minimum agreement on the standard you would like to achieve. And they came up with two standards. One, to eliminate a list of some of the most toxic chemicals from the whole basin area and to make sure it never went into the river. And second, very wide aim, you know, such a wide aim that, you know, you say, but wait, what's the point in having a name? He said, we will see that the salmon will return to the Rhine. That's only two objectives that the government was interested in. With this, they started the process of getting each canton to work with the factories in the canton and they were helped by the fact that even though international agreements on the Rhine was not getting anywhere, during that period, individual governments were doing domestic environmental policies that were far more progressive. So what happened? In each canton, they started acting with companies and doing cleanups. What was the result? The result was that within five years, you know, by about 1993, they had exceeded all targets, which they were supposed to meet in 20 years. They had met by five years. The cleanup was there. And now we know that there is salmon back in the Rhine. Salmon has come back into the sewer of Europe. Now, why I mention this and take trouble to, you know, explain this in detail is you should follow this example simply because 
in most of the countries that we all come from, our rivers are polluted, yes. It's difficult, it's a wicked problem. I know you start solving the pollution of the Ganges or this, you know, Pakistan's Lay River in Islamabad or whatever river of Bagmati in Kathmandu, it's a disaster. Okay. If the Rhine could be cleaned up, please be assured, any river in the world can be cleaned up. Because the Rhine was the worst polluted river in the world. Okay. Now, the question is, you have to understand how that cleanup occurred. And I just outlined to you the process. Now, let me get into the theory. And there's one more example I'll come later, which is on Southern California, on water shortage. Okay. But first, a bit of the theory. I use this new social science, uh, evolving social science it is actually, called cultural theory or theory of plural rationalities or theory of social cultural viability. It's not even got a name that's fixed right now because it's still evolving. It's a theory in making. And it is started uh, by people like Professor Mary Douglas and Aaron Wildavsky in Berkeley and a whole lot of these guys. And uh, what they did, especially Douglas and her disciples, uh, she just passed away about three years ago at the age of 86, active till the last. What she did was, as an anthropologist, she did two things that most anthropologists and social scientists do not do, which is she took, she herself had done some very, very powerful work in, among the newer in Africa and the Congo, but having done that, she came back, took all the knowledge of that anthropology gave about very exotic societies in different climates, you know, all around the world, the last 200, 300 years that they have been working, and she started to generalize from that, saying, is there a pattern? These cultures and societies are very different. The newer of Africa is very different from whatever in Borneo, you know, or from some, uh, you know, group in Ladakh in, 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 in Tibet, you know, uh, and so on. These are very, very different groups and different cultures, different religions. But is there a pattern to what she sees? And lo and behold, a pattern was seen. Okay. That's the pattern I'll talk about. The second thing is, she began, and a lot of us do that, applying this theory or this way of looking at things to modern society. Now, generally in anthropology and sociology, what you have is, you know, it's, you know, all these modern advanced people studying these so-called primitive societies down there, you know. Now what is happening is the flow is being reversed. We're using knowledge that came from the study of, you know, pre-modern societies and a whole lot of other groups and using that knowledge to see that there is something common about human societies. There is a pattern to it and see if that pattern works. Now, what does it consist of? Okay. Think of, you know, this dots of individuals and what are they? They are networked into a pattern. This is known as individualism. It is unbound and unstructured network. The world of consultants, the world of individual small businessmen, this is that world. You know, you and I, we are businessmen. I deal in some kind of a product. You know, I sell plastic cups and you sell bottled water. I need to sell more cups to you. I come to want to sell to you. I don't know you, but I know you and you know him. So can you please, you know, introduce me to him and, and so on. This is how businessmen do. And how successful a businessman is, or a consultant is, depends on the richness of that network. If you see National Geographic, you know, you must have seen, you know, a hawk. It's called the world of the hawk. You know, a hawk hunts very individually. You know, it's around there. Bang, it pounces on a mouse and goes off. And, you know, it doesn't share. It doesn't ask for any help. That's the world of the individualist uh, consultant and others. Huh? Now, this is one type of world. You have another type of world, another way of organizing. Again, dots over here. But you see that these dots are unstructured but bound. This is unstructured and unbound. In an individualistic consultant or businessman, you don't tell them whom they have a right to meet. And this upsets government bureaucrats like anything. I have noticed this, you know. That you get this consultant and, you know, today they are talking to an undersecretary over here and tomorrow they might be talking to the minister. I said, how can you talk to the minister? You know, you're talking to the undersecretary here and you can't, you know. But they do it, you know, because their job depends on finding anything they can. And to them, nothing is sacred. There is no role there. If it serves their business, they'll go and meet anybody. That's how it works. But on this other world, the other way of organizing, these are egalitarian groups. Most NGOs, activists, social protesters belong to this world. 
it is unstructured. There is no commander-in-chief and there is no deputy commander-in-chief and all, you know. Uh, it's a club of people, okay, worried about some problem. But what are they bound by? They are bound by some kind of a we, strong group feeling, but no structure. We comrades are together to save this planet. You know, we comrades, we've got to save our language from disappearing or, you know, whatever. You know, whatever is the problem, they're united by this, okay. It's been likened by a professor friend of mine who is in Cranfield University. He's a management uh, professor. His research, his thesis was interesting. You know, they do funny research these days. I swear, I love to do that. He did his research on dockyard theft and restaurant theft, how waiters cheat and how dockyard workers cheat. And he had this mass of data, and he didn't know what to do with it until he found Carlson theory, and then it provided a pattern. And these expressions are from him, you know. There's a waiter cheating, is there's a hawk waiter cheating, and there's a vulture waiter cheating type. You know, he's got a very funny example. The book is called Cheats at Work. Read it, it's amusing. Uh, so the, he likens them to vultures. You know, if you see vultures hunting for a dead carcass to eat, you know, uh, it's a dis disgusting sight when you see a vultures eating. But, you know, you have 50 vultures circling overhead, and then the moment they find a dead body, they all descend, and each one is pulling like crazy, you know, this, this thing. Huh? Why is it? Because the 50 pair of eyes is better than one pair of eyes, unlike a hawk. They find the prey much easier if there are 50 of them circling than if there's only one. But once they find something, they're all on their own because there's no one to give orders. Okay. Most environmental groups are like that. You find out that it takes, if you have taken part, as I have, you know, it takes about seven days to sometimes get a one-line resolution out of them, and evenings and evenings of meeting is there to convince everybody. You know, that's how it goes. The second kind of world, third kind of world, or way of organizing, is the one we are most familiar with. It's the hierarchic bureaucracy. In a department or an army, for example, you have the commander-in-chief, you have the generals, you have the colonels, you have the brigadiers, I mean, and so on and so forth, right down to the humble soldier, okay? And this world is the world that's ranked and bounded, both. It's structured and it is bound. We belong to, let's say, the Nepal army or the Japanese army or the Ministry of Water Resources, whatever. We belong to a group, but we also have rules of our group of who listens to whom, and who obeys whom and who gives orders to whom. Extremely important in this world. And the role of procedures becomes extremely important. Now, what has happened in the past, you notice, I'll come to another one, which is generally ignored. This is the world of fatalism, the world of donkeys. Now, the wolves one I said in National Geographic, I'm sure you've seen. Uh, this is Jerry Mars. You know, these are so organized that uh, when a wolf hunts, unlike, uh, let's say, a hawk or a vulture, you know, a whole group goes to attack this big uh, deer or something. One attacks from this side, one from this side. They're all coordinated, they attack, and they bring down a much bigger prey than themselves. And when they share, they share by ranks. The alpha male first, alpha female, beta male, beta female. You know, right down to the lowest member who gets a piece of bone, okay? But it's all by rank. The general gets his Mercedes Benz, the colonel gets his, you know, Prado or whatever, you know. The humble, you know, Havaldar down there, you know, the sergeant gets his bicycle. You know, everyone has by rank. You know, that's how it works. That's how those are accepted. Okay. If you don't accept it, you are in the other world. Okay. Now, on the other side is the fatalist world, the world of the donkeys. We say they're strapped to a cart. They can't do anything, you know. It said the girls in the supermarkets check out counter. That's the best one. They don't even have trade unions. There's no trade union of supermarket checkout girls. They can be hired and fired at will almost. Okay. There are many such fatalists. The most fatalist masses. Where do the people belong? Most people generally are there on any issue. They don't know. Couch potatoes, watch the TV, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this is unbound, unstructured, atomized, but they are pressured upon by a structure outside of them. Each one of them, the other three, have a strategy. This one does not. This one has to cope with and absorb the risk of the strategy by all others. This comes about in cultural theory by the use of two parameters, you know, what we call two discriminators. Uh, you know, it's the sense of order. Do you accept a preordained order or do you not accept? And do you accept yourself as a member of a group or do you not accept as a member of the group? And you easily see that it generates four permutations or what we call four styles of organizing. Each one of them is a very different style of organizing. Now, in traditional social sciences, unfortunately, 
the focus has always been on this lower left hand quadrant and the upper right hand quadrant between individualism and hierarchism we all know all development thinking was always about let the government do it or let the market do it and policy was always a swing between these two what we now find out is that cultural theory says there are two other very important ways of organizing which if you miss you are in deep trouble you have to give voice or these other voices must also be listened to especially the three fatalists well they are there they don't strategize themselves but it's important fatalists can react pretty badly they can kick like donkeys and when did they kick sometimes consumers boycott products that's fatalist donkeys kicking in india in one election one of the leading parties was expected to win but they found out that the voters the donkeys just kicked and the bjp lost unexpected but in america recently the donkeys have again kicked you know and known as known as the tea party so these reactions do come in but it's not always somebody else galvanizes them into action okay let me tell you why this is important to realize the role of this third leg as i call it the the egalitarian one the best example i have is uh, of brent spar the oil rig in the north sea that shell and the british government decided that it was too old it could be dumped into the sea it was agreed the british government said okay shell the company that owned it said okay and they were about to do it suddenly out of nowhere appeared an ngo and the only NGO I know in the world which has an Air Force and a Navy, and I think in Japan you know them very well, they're called Greenpeace. You know, they have this rubber dinghy Navy flotilla and a helicopter Air Force. <laughs> and they landed on this place, you know, and would not allow the rig to be dumped into the sea. Why? Because they came from a different value system. They said it is polluting the earth. You don't dump your garbage into the ocean, you know. Now, John Major, the British Prime Minister at that point, really... Have, uh, you know, scolded the shell executives who were sort of taken aback. You should just go ahead and dump it. You are wimps if you don't do it, you know. But shell executives knew better because German motorists, the fatalists up there, had already started boycotting shell products. So they said, okay, we won't do it. And they towed this rig to a Norwegian fjord. It lay there for many years and to decide what to do. Now it has been cut up into sections and made into a pontoon and a ferry. So rather than rotting at the base of the sea, it has become a useful device that does not pollute the environment, provides some economic benefit somewhere. Okay. Now that would not have come about if the public-private partnership between Shell and the British government alone had taken place. It would not have happened. Okay. So there is a virtuous circle of improvement that comes about when all, had this been considered previously, Shell and the British government probably would not have taken a decision like this, okay? Now, what these four styles of organizing do is they provide you four views of nature, four views of risk. We know that markets are risk-taking. Market individualism is all about risk. Okay, there's a danger there, but if I go in there and do this, I'll make a lot of money. That's what markets are all about. It's innovating. It's, you know, it's very, very dynamic in that sense. The egalitarian world of organizing is risk avoiding they see danger everywhere and the reason they see danger everywhere is because they need to keep their group together because these groups don't have commander-in-chief or anything to give orders so there's a tendency to split environmental groups have a tendency to split like crazy okay like amoebas or, 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 or atom or nuclear <laughs> atom okay so the, by alarm by you know the strategy of risk avoiding alarm they keep groups together. Comrades, we've got to be together. You know, the big bad, bad world is attacking us. You know, they're getting more of this thing and so on and so forth. So there is a tendency among egalitarians to take issues way out of proportion, blow it out into the, into, into, into the media and so on, but that's their nature. They are not wholly right, but there is a kernel of truth in what they are doing, and it would be good for governments and businesses to begin to consider that. Of course, they don't have to accept everything. A different type of rationality is followed completely by the hierarchic environment of government departments and so on and so forth. It's a risk minimizing procedural rationality. Yes, there is risk, but you know we can manage it. If only you follow the environmental impact guidelines, 
you know, we, we just follow that and if you do it, everything will be fine. Whereas the other one doesn't even accept those guidelines and don't do it, okay? And finally, you have the, the risk absorbing fatalism. These poor chaps have to absorb the risk from every other strategy. As long as they absorb the risk and keep quiet and say, you know what to do, everything is fine. The moment they refuse to accept the risk, there has been policy overturning like crazy. United States recent election is one example, but there are many, many other examples of uh, one can give of the fatalists being incited, whether it is to protest against a dam or whatever, or a nuclear power plant or whatever. They all employ very different strategies. Markets always tell you that just get the price right, commoditize, you know, put you know, put the price on a commodity, put a price on the water, put a this, and then everything will be fine, you know. Activist egalitarians say, no, 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 that's not the solution at all. You should taboo. You know, don't build nuclear power plants, don't build high dams, you know, they're destroying nature, don't cut the rainforest, and so on and so forth. It's the hierarchs who say manage, you know, somehow, yes, you know, we got to do this, but we got to do that. Huh? At this point, you know, I'll just give you one example. You know, we... Most of you must be riding bicycles around here. Have you ever thought how the bicycle ever came about? If you look at the history, there's a wonderful book by a Dutch uh, uh, sociologist, W.B. Bierker. It's called Bicycles, Bacalites, and Balls, published by the MIT Press. And uh, it's fascinating, the history of the bicycle. He finds that the Leonardo da Vinci's disciple left behind a drawing that looks suspiciously like the modern bicycle. Of course, we don't know whether they actually built one or not. You know, we never saw him. But the first time a bicycle appeared in its modern form was in you know, 1796, somewhere around there, when a Parisian count, you know, a dashing young guy, you know, built these two wheels and put a board on top of it and went trundling down a Parisian park to impress his girlfriends, okay? Now, that became a rage of the town like hula hoop, you know, you had one time these hula hoops here, and everybody wanted one. Now, this is market individualism. You know, it's not just money, profit, you know, it's also the psychic profit of, you know, fame and all that. Huh? So this is what happened. Now, immediately there was a reaction after a while because everybody was getting these infernal machines that were trundling down. It must have been horribly uncomfortable compared to what you and I write today. Well, come to the quadrant on the right side. You know, too many grandmothers carrying baskets of eggs were being knocked into hedges by these devils. Huh? There was outcry, church groups, you know, this is a machine of the devil, you know, it should be banned, taboo. Okay. Now come the French authorities and the German authorities and they have problem. You know, you can't stop Parisian counts from doing what they want. But at the same time, you can't allow grandmothers carrying baskets of eggs to be knocked into hedges. Okay. So what do you do? Typical, they come out with procedures, rules, regulations, you know, license. You have to have a license to run this thing. You also needed uh, permission and you could only drive these things on certain streets, on certain hours, on certain days and so on and so forth. Now, okay. It did satisfy everybody, but everybody got a little bit of the peace, you know. The individualist, the machine was not banned, okay, so there was still freedom to use it. The egalitarians, yeah, 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 when grandmothers are carrying baskets of eggs, at least these devils are not around, you know. Up there, you know, there is some regulation we have in place, we have things under control, you know, things are fine. The trouble starts immediately at this point. It's a very dynamic process, you see, this is why cultural theory is so dynamic, it explains the dynamism. Now, if you are a young guy wanting to impress your girlfriends and you want to ride these things and you ride at a time when she's not even there, probably asleep, you know, that's the only time you're allowed to ride this. There's no fun, right? So what do they do? Next round of innovation. They invent brakes, pneumatic tires, you name it. Beaker, and then there's new round of protest, new control, and so on and so forth. Beaker identifies nine cycles of this kind of virtuous improvements, as he call it, calls it, to get the modern bicycle today. Now, this applies to water resources as well. You can see same kind of thing going on in many water decisions, okay? Uh, this I'll show you in a separate thing. Uh, this is basically about the myths of nature, how, you know, the way you are organized in these four ways determines how you see nature. Now, we are trained to think like physicists and chemists that there's only one reality out there, which is what water is, H2O, and so on and so forth. <laughs> My dear friends, no. In the social sciences, you suddenly find out that perception is important and there are different perceptions. So it means that even nature is seen as very different depending on how you're organized. Let me give you this example. This is done by, a, she's doing a PhD in UCLA, a student of mine, and you know, she, did, she did this design. It's very fancy. Okay, watch very carefully. 
you know, if you are in this individualistic quadrant, nature is robust. You know, nature has no problem. It is like a marble inside an infinite cup. Okay? I can push it as much as I want. I can build my high dams. I can build my nuclear power plants. Nature will take care of itself. We have heard lots of people say that. I'm sure you've met across, you know, in water. There's no problem. The river will take care of itself. You know, the salmon know where to go. You know, it's not a problem. Build your dam. Build your this thing. Okay? Nature is robust. Okay? I'll come to that second one later because it's a more dangerous one. So nothing will happen here. He says the cup is infinite. Okay? Nature is robust. Now you come to hierarchy. And you've got to notice that it's a marriage between the lower two. Because the lower one sees nature as fragile. All the environment is, oh, nature, it's so fragile. Don't touch it, you know. It'll be destroyed. Don't do anything. Don't do taboo, as I said, you know. But then they say, the guy up there have to manage both, like the bicycle chaps. And they say, okay, okay, but it's within limits, it's okay. And we set the limits. You know, we have experts in our department. We've got 25 PhDs and, you know, we've got different, you know, trout experts and we've got legal experts and we've got this. And we all set this. Wonderful environmental impact guidelines. Just follow those, and as long as you follow those guidelines, within those limits, you're fine. Nature is robust, it'll take care of itself, because we have said so. Our experts have said so. You go beyond and see what happens. If you go beyond the limit, then it's very bad, you see. It'll be a catastrophe. The trouble is, you know, the egalitarians don't see it that way, because to them, you know, watch very carefully. You touch it and it'll go. It's like a marble perched on a football, okay? There you are. <laughs> So don't touch, don't do anything, okay? Whereas for the poor fatalist, it's like a marble on top of a table, you know, I don't know which way it goes. I come to work in the morning, do what my boss says, at 5 o'clock I go home and, you know, watch TV, you know, that's how it is, okay? So the myth, you know, nature, how you view nature depends on how you're organized. And all water issues, you are, you know, see, failure to see all these perspectives is what leads to policy sort of, you know, blinkers and ultimately policy failures. If you analyze policies that have failed, elegant failures, you'll see that some voice or the other was just not taken into consideration. It's not just environmental views not taken into consideration. The former Soviet Union refused to take the market into consideration and see what happened to them. Okay? And Boris Yeltsin's Russia refused to take uh, you know, strong government into consideration and that became a mafia rule there, you know, with complete no government. Hmm. It's important here, besides how you see nature, how you filter information. Each one of these ways of organizing filters information in its own way. And, they, and what is filtered in as information and data is very different from what is filtered out as noise and rubbish. The trouble is, one set of people who filter in data, one way of organizing, and one that's filtered out as rubbish and noise, that rubbish and noise can be data to somebody else. Now, this is important to realize. You know, there was a case in Nepal, 1993 massive cloud burst. It's the biggest cloud burst we had. We must have had bigger ones than that. We had 540 millimeters of rain in, well, officially 24 hours, but actually 9 hours. Huge amount of rain. Washed down hill slides. We lost 40% of our electricity system at that point. You know, several bridges washed out. About 2,000, 3,000 people dead. You know, it's a huge Massive thing. There was a barrage, there is one, uh, on the Bagmati River, just at the point where the river comes out into the Tarai Plains uh, from the Himalaya. Now, this barrage was designed by very smart consultants from the World Bank, uh, all kinds of you know donors. Huh? And uh, they looked at the data, and when you design a barrage, you design it for the maximum flood, you know. Okay, you can't design for the, you know, whatever, absolute maximum, but you take a reasonable guess of once in a 500 year flood, once in a 1000 year flood, you know, or whatever. And they designed it. When they were looking at the data, which is very poor in Nepal and many places of the world, it said that, you know, 8000 cubic meters per second is the maximum flood. Fine. There was one data that said 12,000. Now, if you design a Barrage for 8,000 and designing for 12,000 means that 12,001 is much more costly and the World Bank didn't have that kind of money and all, the government didn't have the money. You know all that problem. Huh? So there was a tendency there to say, no, this is a statistical outlier. I mean, it never happens. You know, I mean, this is probably a mistake. Even if it happened, it's too rare to happen and so on and so forth. So they rejected that 12,000 cubic meters per second. And when the flood happened in 1993, guess what the flow was? 16,000. Double of the 8,000 they accepted. 
This is important to realize why data is filtered out. Now, if an environmentalist group, we didn't have one there at that time, had come across this sense, then they would immediately have said that 12,000 rejected as noise and rubbish by one group of engineering designers. They would have taken it and said, my God, this is, you know, you've designed it wrong. You know, the danger is so high, you know, there could be a 12,000 cumic flood. And this happens all the time. So data for one, uh, it could be noise for another and vice versa. Now, if you look at the first one is the fatalist world. It's whatever comes, the couch potato, you know, whatever the TV program says, I don't know. I don't decide. My culture is decided by somebody else. So the broadcaster is the filter that sets what the data should be to the fatalist masses. You go to the individualistic world, and what do you have over there? It's data picking. It's data picking. It means I choose my data. Like this consultant who can find a minister if he has to, to get his data, you know. They, he will pick whatever is necessary. Okay. You come to the activist egalitarian world, and it's very different. There, the boundary is a filter because everybody has to talk to everyone. They believe in dialogue. They are great believers in dialogue. And soon dialogue can be a cacophony of noises and nobody is listening to anybody. Eventually, these charismatic boundary filters say, this is data, this is what we accept, and this is what we don't accept. And that's the theology of the movement, you know, that we have to protect this species, or we have to do that, or this dam is, you know, bad, or something like that. And most interesting is up here, the world of the hierarchs, the departments and others. Here you see that the whole process, because it is based on procedural rationality, it is about registration. It is about who has the right to bring in what kind of data from outside and to register it, and who has the right to give out what kind of data. So you always have this filter where some information is accepted, some information is rejected, and some information is suppressed from going out, is classified, government, secret, and all, you know. None of that is actually acceptable to the other two down here. And that's what leaves a lot of dynamics. Now, this gives rise to four types of water. Just four views of nature, four types of information filtering, and so on and so forth. Now, you see, start with uh, individualism. And water is a private good. There's plenty of resource. You know, except that, you know, getting it there requires the right price. And just set the price rise, right, and we can supply you. And even here we are supplied, you can see this is private water. Tankers, something like 15,000 or 20,000 tankers that supply water to the city of Karachi because the municipal, city, uh, uh, municipal system is broken down, almost non-functional. So in Kathmandu too, we have huge tanker market uh, that's going on, okay. These are private water. You know, just set the price right and we will supply whatever is necessary. At the other diagonal end is what is called public water, municipal water, the one that's supplied here in good functioning municipalities supply water to different sections of the town, to different categories of people. And if you live in a government quarter, you get more, more hours. If you live in this area, you get three hours of water and so on by rules, regulations, etc. Okay. So that's public water and private water. As we said, these are not the only two types of water. There is common pool water. This is people who believe that water belongs to everybody. Water is a human right. You have heard this. It's become part of the international discourse now. Big fight about it between the private sector water suppliers, international, and the human rights activists who say that, no, you cannot privatize water. Water is a right. And finally, on the fate list, it's club. Water is a club good. What is a club good? My best example, if you land in Bombay airport, uh, and to go to the city, you pass close by or through this slum, the largest slum in the world, which has got about a million people in it, Dharavi, okay? And I saw this very funny billboard, you know, as I was passing Dharavi. Uh, it was an advertisement for one of the most expensive bottled waters in India. I forget what brand it was, but it was very expensive. Now, the point is, those poor people in the slums get six liters of water per day for everything. And you have this ad over there for this expensive bottled water, and that bottled water for those people in the slum might as well be on the moon. They are not members of the club, so they have no access to that water, okay? So you see four types of water that is generated by the way you are organized, your styles of organizing, okay? If you take only the three, just take the three, you leave the fatalists out because they don't strategize, you find out that policy making you know, is confined to a three-legged stool. Unfortunately, most policy making was seen as confined to two legs or one leg only. 
the government's made policy and this is it, you know. Well, markets have their own policies. Don't tell me Coca-Cola does not have a policy, you know. And, of course, activists have their own policies. The question is on any important water conflict issue, if you've got the different perceptions of risk, the different view of what the problem is from these different groups, you will see that very different solutions can emerge. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is to apply this case to success and failure. Now, climate change. You see that, well, we have all kinds of problems, and Copenhagen hasn't exactly been a success, so I would call it currently in the current stage a kind of a failure. But you see that different definitions of the problems are at work there. It's one climate change, all right, but what is the climate change problem? Some say it is population. It's too many people, too many Chinese, too many Indians, you know, and so therefore control population. That seems to be the solution. Markets, to markets, population is never a problem. More population means more consumers. What's the problem, you know? Pricing is the problem. Get the prices right and we'll invent our way out of the problem. You know, we'll get new technologies, we'll get clean technologies, we'll get, uh, you know, storing and sequestering of carbon, we'll do all kinds of things. Just get the price right, okay. To the activists, it's also a P problem, but it's not a pricing or a population problem. It's a problem of profligacy, greed. Comrades, we are too greedy. We ride SUVs, yes, SUVs when we should be riding bicycles. So, the famous ex uh, sentence of Mahatma Gandhi when he said, the world has enough for our needs, but not enough for our greed. That's a classic egalitarian statement over here. So you see that there are three very, very different values coming to define a problem. There is not even an agreement on what the problem is. So the solutions are definitely going to be different, okay? Which is why the climate change issues have not moved forward. Copenhagen was a total failure as far as I'm concerned, and Cancun might be even a bigger failure because nobody is moving with any innovative ideas. Why is that? Because there's too much fixation on procedures. Procedures are necessary, but procedures alone will not solve the problem. What would be necessary to solve the problem? Some freedom to the market to bring new solutions of renewable energy. Not much is happening on that front. And then some kind of a move of the world away to mitigation and to reducing the pollution impact. That would satisfy all three, but it has not happened. Does it happen? It does. Even in climate, look at the ozone treaty. The ozone treaty is a success. It's an amazing success. It's still a climate treaty. If you read what happened with the ozone treaty, you find out that, yes, there was a lot of tough negotiation, and the Montreal Protocol that came into being actually ended up solving the problem. But the history of how this happened shows that the engagement of the three solidarities was much more robust. There were multinational corporations. There were governments. There were activist environmentalists who were all together. And the funny part was, you know, there's a wonderful book by Richard Benedict, uh, who was the U.S. ambassador to this ozone treaty. And his book is very interesting, and he described to me when I had met him, you know, that he said um, the biggest pressure on the American government came from American companies. They said American government was taking this very nationalistic position, like in the cleanup of the Rhine, every government was just trying to protect its own national interest, you know. American government, oh, American government cannot agree to this kind of thing. So American multinational companies came and put pressure on the American government saying, you don't get a treaty, you won't have an American business in this sector anymore. You know, the pressure was phenomenal. The treaty ultimately what it did, it provided the companies the alternative to phase out in a, in a regular manner. It provided the government some regulation, all governments around the world. And finally, it provided the activist also with the idea that you are actually phasing things out. And therefore, you had a successful ozone treaty. Okay. It hasn't happened in the treaty I mentioned to you, the Nepali treaty on Mahakali between Nepal and India, a disaster because it's only one group of people holding on to one idea. There's no space for the other consideration. Okay. Previously, this is the old view. The old assumption was that, you know, you have different governments that get together, they have a consensus, and you have an international treaty. Okay. We find out that's necessary. Governments have to get together to get the treaty going. But that consensus will not, by governments alone don't work. As the Mahakali Treaty in Nepal showed you, you know, you had two governments that agreed and a parliament that passed everything and nothing moved. Why? Because this is the new reality. The new reality is, yes, you still need governments. You need good governments, effective governments. But weaving across international boundaries are environmental activists, multinational corporations, scientific and professional groups, 
non-governmental social organizations. I mean, I am a member, let's say, of a scientific community. Now, I am more worried what my scientific colleagues in the rest of the world say than I am worried about what my minister may say in Nepal on a certain issue. Now, this is a very different scenario. The same applies to activist environmentalists. It applies to, you know, multinational corporations. You know. So, the point is that consensus has to be arrived at through a more clumsy and a more broad stakeholder process than what we are conventionally designed to think about. The test of any treaty, whether it is going right or wrong, is to test and see what is happening. Is the climate change treaty sufficiently plural that it is providing space to these new ideas? It's also providing space to these new actors. Not everyone, mind you, is going to get everything they want. Everyone ultimately is going to be dissatisfied, but just satisfied enough as the first step, saying we'll fight another battle later, but this much we can live with. Those have been the kind of successful treaties. I told you a successful example, I'll give you one more, which is an example on California. Now, this is on Nepal, but I'll come to this later, okay? In Nepal, in California, the classic case of water scarcity, and I know a lot of you deal with that, but it's worth examining how it was solved in some places. California is a big, messy place. They say if it was a separate country, it would be the sixth largest economy in the world. It's a very complicated place. And what happened there was that two things. Standard was they had California water districts, they had municipal utilities, they were designed in this hierarchic principle of supplying any demand that came along. They had tremendous redundancies built into their system, large systems and all that. Two things happened. The two things that happened was that first, uh, it was unable to meet tremendously growing demand. Everybody wanted to come and live in California. All industries started coming in there. Now, it was, you know, there are physical limits to growth. So, when this happened, basically, the, um, there, there, there were shortages coming up. The second thing was that new demand started coming up. While the demand was rising, the departments were all smart enough. They said, oh, let's get some fish expert also to be in the department. They'll advise us. Oh, let's get a legal expert. Oh, let's get a sociologist. So, they did that, you know. But then soon found out that each of them were within these disciplines were coming out with very, very different definitions of what the problem was. And there was a sort of an impasse. It was happening. Then came two kind of public decisions. One was a decision on what's called the peripheral canal. The voters turned it down. California has a wonderful system of referendums called proposition. And that proposition was defeated. The attempt by Southern California to build this peripheral canal in the San Francisco Bay uh, Delta uh, and take water down south was defeated. Now, once it's defeated in a referendum, that's the end. So, you could not bank on getting more water through that. Okay. That was the first thing. The second thing is these environmental protection laws started coming in. People who were very important economic actors like canoe, people who did canoeing and rafting and uh, fishing and wildlife uh, re recreation and all, became important actors. And they said there needs to be water for life, wildlife. Okay. It became so bad that in Southern California, the Supreme Court of California overturned two major projects. One was a major housing project, and the court said, you haven't proved that you've got the water to build this project. Where are you going to get your water to build this big housing project? The second was a thermal power plant that Southern California, San Diego was trying to build, and the court said, you haven't proved that you have the water for the cooling. Where are you going to get your water? Until you do that, we cannot allow you. Now, this started creating all kinds of problems. Now, see, this is a problem. It's a big economy like that. Uh, just as with the Sandoz spill and the, uh, the disaster that came around, a disaster is always a mind-opening moment if taken advantage of, people started acting on this. Now, some groups, it's a very complicated, messy place. Some groups had groundwater to fall back on, so they didn't have to take any decision. They kept relying on their groundwater buffer. But some who did not had to start taking innovative measures. And the innovative measures were really fascinating. The innovative measures were, came with innovative pricing structure. The innovative pricing structure, which was never done before, allowed for three principles of parity, proportionality, and priority. 
satisfying each of the three legs of the triangle individually. How? Parity. They calculated that given the evapotranspiration, given this, given the size of the family and all, there is this basic that each one can use. So that made everybody equal. That was what the environmentalists would always argue for. Everyone is equal, right? So basic human needs was kind of met. Above that was a rate structure that's quite innovative and has still stayed together, which said, you know, you use more water, you pay for it, but then you pay it in a very funny way, you know, which allows some governmental intervention in times of drought and scarcity to bring an order and so on. So it made the, the regulating government happy also that we have some space to control and do things. And finally, it made the individualists also, they didn't like it. Previous stuff was better, you know, you pay and you get what you want. Here, there was still this idea of priority that if you really needed more water, you pay more for it and you can get it. So there is still, there's not a blanket ban saying you cannot use more than so many liters of water. So it provided space and flexibility to all three, and that has stayed together. It's a very innovative solution. So the idea is that it is these things that allow you know, the three legs of the policy stool, if you allow space for all these major three voices, you know, the fourth one does not react, and you end up with a stable policy. I'd like to close with this particular slide, and then we can get into questions, whatever you have to ask. This is a very interesting slide, and uh, it's in North Kathmandu, next to a national park on a hill. It's called Shivapuri. This is the cover of a book, you know, and I have a new, you know, major forward on it. Uh, it was published out of uh, first, it was the work done at Yasa, but then the book was published and in Europe and was not available in South Asia. So a Kathmandu book publisher, Himal Books, published it uh, recently with Oxford University and Yasa together. And uh, uh, the, uh, the main author, Mike Thompson, and I were asked to write a 40-page new introduction of what happened in these last 20 years since the book was published. Okay. Now, this particular place is very interesting. It's a disappearing pond. There's a spring, as you can see, where the question mark is. And the spring water was used and collected in this big pond, which is now filled up, as you can see, has become a volleyball court. Okay. There is still some irrigation used. But why is irrigation declined? Because this is next to a national park. And for the poor villagers, as in Africa, for instance, living next to a national park is not easy. The monkeys come and, you know, wild boars come and, you know, they eat up everything. And you can't kill those bloody things because, you know, they're protected. Okay? So what do you do? So luckily for the villagers, you know, all these rich tourism entrepreneurs wanted to have nice bungalows next to a national park, you know. So they came and started offering obscene amounts of money for the land. So villagers started selling their land. I mean, you can't get much grown anywhere and whatever grows the monkeys eat, you know. So they sold their land. They went down below and made small house and got jobs in Kathmandu from whatever they had, okay. Not all, most of them, okay. Now, if you no longer farm, are you interested in maintaining a pond? That's not your priority. What is your priority? Your priority is you have to commute to Kathmandu every day for your job and your priority is a bus park. Now, this is where the thing was coming in, that they had filled this up to make a bus park. Under that tree, you see a bunch of jokers like me, who are worried about groundwater decline in Kathmandu and, you know, common pool water disappearing, pollution of the Bagmati River. We were agitating, and we still are, to revive these traditional ponds all around Kathmandu Valley to, to store the water and also help that water infiltrate into the groundwater. You know, we believe that that will clean up the Bagmati to some extent. It will provide groundwater for drinking in, in the dry season because groundwater is the best storage you can have and so on and so forth. And moreover, this is very aesthetic. You know, your nice pond is much better than a dirty bus park. Okay. Now, but the problem is now you see there's different definition of the problem. You know, is the problem lack of water? No, the villagers say we have no lack of water. Yeah, but Kathmandu has a lack of water. Let Kathmandu get its water from somewhere else. You know, our need is a bus park. The youth of the village say they need a flat space and Nepal doesn't have much of it uh, for, to play volleyball. Our argument was, okay, come on, you can make a bus park in some other place that doesn't have a spring. Uh, you can play volleyball, you know, in another place we can flatten out some place and play volleyball and so on and so forth. It was not working until somebody got this bright idea. There is an important temple here of, of the dangerous form of Shiva called Jor Mahankal. Shiva is one of the deities of Hindu pantheon. It's a very powerful temple. And his consort Kali, the goddess Kali, is nearby. 
the argument was if you revive this pond and make it a very nice spring and pond kind of place, it becomes a very nice recreation and religious spot. And the people who left farming and have gone and got jobs in Kathmandu can have shops to sell things to religious pilgrims. You know, So in a sense what happens is these people can also get jobs, they get some uh, money, there's some individualism, uh, uh, you know, activists, we start getting our groundwater and, and ponds and the government is, can come in there to do some better regulation and, and manage things. Now, it hasn't happened yet. I put a question mark there, will it go this way or will it be destroyed? We don't know. The fight is still on. Okay. But basically the idea is that if you had space of this kind of constructive engagement and the United Nations uh, World Water Development Report, the third one, which we released in uh, Istanbul at the World Water Forum last year, basically it argues, if you haven't read that World Water Development Report, I suggest you just look at the inside front cover. There's a diagram there that tells you what the basic philosophy of that whole report is. Huh? And since I was on the uh, sort of the technical committee there, let me tell you, you know, uh, I'm quite proud of that report for a simple reason. You know, first of all, it's a report done by 22 UN agencies. Now, 22 agencies, first of all, writing a report is madness, okay? Funny thing is they did manage to write the report. They did manage to write it in time to have it released when they said they would at the World Water Forum. And more important than that, a report written by 22 agencies has something interesting to say. Generally, they don't, okay? The interesting thing to say is in that one diagram which distinguishes it's a sort of a box diagram, which has what is called the water box at the bottom, and it has called what is called outside the water box. And the basic philosophical argument in the whole report is that, yes, lots of things happen in the water box. Water managers, they have to do all kinds of things. But much of what happens in water is influenced even more heavily by what happens outside the water box. How much money the finance ministry puts in industry might probably have more impact on water than what the water resource ministry does. How the education ministry teaches students about water will probably have more Im impact on water. So there is a need for water managers to think outside of the water box. This is a key, key phrase, thinking outside the water box. So solutions to these kind of intractable problems are going to come from partly from within the water box, there has to be good engineering, there has to be good environmental work. I mean, all this has to be done. But a lot of the solutions, like finding these guys, you know, the chance to have new shops and sell things to religious uh, pilgrims, you know, will probably get you a spring restored than otherwise. And that is thinking outside the water box. So as water diplomats, I would argue with you that you'd probably be better off, you know, trying to widen, you need your disciplines, you need a good civil engineering background or a good legal water background or a good, you know, study of hydrogeology, whatever you're doing, you know. But in addition to that, when you deal with problems, you'll have to come to address things that people never thought of normally. And you have to talk to people with different views of what the problem is. The very definition of the problem here is not the lack of pond you know, for that piece of land. There's some other definition. Now, can you work with these varied definitions that are widely varying and not everyone is right, everyone is partially right. That is the point. They are not wholly wrong either. Neither the volleyball playing youth nor the guys who want a bus park, they're all right, but partially right. And so are we who want to restore Kathmandu's groundwater by building these ponds all over the valley around the rim, you know. So this is where I think uh, uh, sort of environmental diplomacy or environment hydro diplomacy as I call it, there's an article of mine that I have copied for you guys here if you're interested, it's called the essence of hydro diplomacy in Nepal of what the problem of dealing with Mahakali and all these are like. Now hydro diplomacy has to consider these wider framings and that is the message that I want to leave you with. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And, okay, I guess the, you may have many questions and comments for his lectures, so please do not hesitate to just ask. Just raise your hand and anybody? You feel some hesitate? Right? No? Yeah. Okay.
Thank you. Thank, thank you for exciting uh, presentation. As an anthropologist, uh, uh, I'm really happy you, you mentioned the, the meritocracy issue. And my question is, uh, uh, well, you illustrate the new reality of the like uh, uh, decision making, the new model. Ah. Let me put it there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, this one. And you compared with the, the, the old one, which is the nation states as used to be a main player of the yeah. decision making. But uh, in this new mode, it seems to be the multi, uh, what we say, the, the multi Multi stakeholder. Yeah, yeah, yeah multi stakeholder. Yeah. yeah. But uh, in this model, who's going to be, like, uh, uh, when we want to have the, the make the, uh, consensus, we need some, uh, main players to, I mean, to, to manage the, the different actors and who's going to, uh, to be the organizer of this? Uh, really good question. Really good question. The answer is it's not simple. The leader kind of, in these complex situations, they seem to emerge first, okay? It seems to depend more on courage, moral courage, then it seems to depend on intelligence. I mean, everybody has enough normal intelligence, okay? So where do they emerge? And we have found out, and there's still people doing these studies, actually, where you find out that these leaderships seem to emerge in all three areas. You know, there, there, a crisis comes, like, you know, the Sandoz spill, okay? This Dutch minister emerged as the leader, okay? Uh, you have this California case, and that's really well studied. What happened was, it was, there was no one major figure you could point to. But what was amazing was that in each department, like the water department, there were people who, of course, were fighting, saying, no, no, we do things as we did in the past and all, okay? But uh, there were people who were beginning to realize that, wait a minute, you know, and old way is not going to work. So let's have to think differently, okay? So that's where people, the leaders emerged, okay? Uh, in the environmental side also, there were, well, you have very rabid environmentalists, oh, no to everything and all that. There were people there who realized, with the, especially with the fish, you know, that a proposal that actually worked in Southern California, in, in the Bay Area, not Southern California, was a very innovative proposal to save fish, not by blanket banning, not by putting a governmental cap, but allowing the fish and wildlife department to actually buy water on auction and store it, okay, and use it also whenever they needed it uh, to go. Now, this was not what they were used to. They were used to as much water as possible. The governments were happy that, you know, at least now Fish and Wildlife Department also uh, is under some kind of disciplinary budgeting pressure now. They can't use as much water as they like. They have to say, this much water we have, how do we use it wisely? The environmentalists didn't like that idea, but they said, okay, at least it saves the fish for the time being. It's not the best solution, but, okay. And the, and the environmental leaders there from the environmental movement were willing to compromise on this. The others were not willing to compromise, but they said, no, 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 wait, you know, if we don't do this, it'll be a disaster. Nothing will happen. You know, uh, if you go to that three-legged diagram, that little bit of, uh, you know, that little bit of uh, thing in the center is what everybody has, okay? But if they didn't go for that, then there would be nothing. They would have nothing. Okay, it's not everything they want, but it's more than the nothing they will have. So the leaders emerged in each one of these areas, willing to listen to the others, number one, and willing to appreciate the arguments made by the other side, and then willing to look at their own problems and say, what if I did things this way, would they accept it? These three things were very crucial. Okay, and that is what determined leaders in all three areas. You know, it was not one charismatic figure, but, and also the fourth thing was that the, each one of them were looking for people in, in those areas, looking for people in businesses, looking for people in government, looking for people in the environment movement, whom they could talk to and, you know, find these creative solutions and new ways out, you know. So that is what worked. So I think most of us will probably not end up becoming some famous, you know, uh, environmental guru of something, but what we probably will do is probably some of us who will be successful will be successful in crafting new solutions by listening to others, appreciating their problems, and proposing solutions that might not be fully what they like, but they can accept 50, 60 percent of it, and that's fine. So that's where the leadership emerges. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, that's very good, important point, I guess. Yeah. That's, yeah. I agree completely with you. So any other questions, comments? Please do not hesitate, even in students. I was not so clear that there's no question. I mean, I, I'm leaving behind some references. Okay. I, I've copied it onto a file to you here. Thanks, thanks. Uh, there's thanks, a please. set of references that I think is, if you're interested in this new way of doing social sciences, uh, there are uh, these references that would help uh, in uh, uh, analyzing things from this kind of different perspective. I told you, this is a new science, a new social science in making. Um, you know, there are people, there are groups of people all over, you know, from Bergen in, in Norway to, you know, to Kathmandu in Nepal to, you know, Oxford and to Bremen in Germany and there's a whole lot scattered around the world. Uh, and we find this uh, interesting because, you know, let me give you an example for, as a minister, when I was minister <clears throat> for the short period, I considered uh, a couple of things that are very contradictory but were very successful that I managed, you know. And with hindsight now, at that point, you know, it was just, I think, my background that helped me. But uh, with hindsight, when I reflect back, and it's already seven years since I left, you know, <laughs> as minister, uh, I think that it is this theory that allowed me to function the way I did. You see, if I was a normal politician, I'm an academic, okay? If I was a normal politician, I'd either be a socialist or a free market, you know, liberal guy or whatever, saying give freedom to business or, you know, get governments to do more regulation, you know. That would not happen, you know. And so when I came in, the electricity sector, for instance, you know, water was, had electricity and flood and all that. You know? One of the problems that I had was that uh, my predecessors, you know, for the, you know, three or four years before me, had not managed to take decision on promotions. Now, th this is the biggest organization in Nepal. It has 10,000 employees. It's a huge thing, you know, the electricity. When the top management's promotion has been held back for two to three years, you create a bad constipation in the whole organization, you know, bad morale, bad everything. Yeah? My first priority was I said, listen, I mean, if, if this organization, this government utility is going to function properly, you've got to have good morale. And all. Now, there is a huge problem. I won't go into details, but, you know, the reason they were not able to do it was, it, it was unbelievable. You know, there would be court cases and there would be all sorts of funny things. Huh? The secretary of the government, I give him great credit for it, and uh, together with him, we worked, and it took two months to figure out how 19 people needed to be promoted at the very top level, you know. These are the, just below the chief executive are 19 positions, very high, okay. And that was stuck, you see, okay. And there were 26 contenders. So we had to do all kinds of funny things, you know, convince some that, okay, your turn will come next, and then someone, you know, something else, and send someone on a fancy scholarship abroad. I mean, we had to do all these crazy things, huh? And we managed to get this done, okay. So that is on the top end, the bureaucratic end. You improve that, okay. My next one was, the, during the Maoist insurgency, a uh, set of hydropower plants built originally by Norwegians had been privatized in the 1970s under World Bank pressure, by the way. Now the World Bank tells us privatized, but it was nationalized, okay? And these had been bombed by the Maoists. Now the government didn't have money, and if nothing was done, it would become junk. It was about a total of 17 megawatts altogether. I and the finance minister got together to privatize this. You know, we spent a huge amount of time, and we ultimately got this little portion, not everything, uh, we still have a big governmental thing, but this small portion was privatized and to date it remains the largest privatization in Nepal's history. And the private sector has restored that, uh, the, the, the power plants is functioning, they're making money, they're investing in new ones now. Okay. And then the third leg, that's the second leg, the third leg, I was able to push through a legislation called communitization of electricity. It allows any organized rural village community to buy electricity in bulk from the national utility and retail by themselves. Okay. So what it does is they buy at a bulk rate and they retail by themselves. They make a lot of money with their own whatever rate they set. Okay. The, gov the government utility gets the benefit that, you know, because there is now double accounting. You know, there is a accounting at the bulk transformer or the feeder and then the retailing people. So the theft is zero now. So they get a huge benefit because in places where there was 36% theft, it, the loss has now come down to only 9%. It's a huge benefit for the utility, but for the community, now they have control over their own system. So it is that egalitarian level. So I thought to myself, I said, listen, if I didn't have this particular social science behind me, I would either be doing only privatization, or I would only be doing communitization, or I would only be doing the government strengthening thing, you know. Okay. But I was able to do all three, you know. 
So my socialist friends are aghast that, you know, I allowed this privatization to happen. And I'm quite proud of it, actually, because it's the best I should, you know. And my private friends are really aghast that I brought about this communitization of electricity. But then I say, listen, I'm a cultural theorist. I can have my cake and eat it, you know. I mean, so that's all right. You know, I can do all three. So this is what these clumsy solutions sort of allow you to do. It moves the overall structure forward. So I think that's where the uh, thing is. Right, right. So, yeah, okay. So in this conference, the more than 80% students are, uh, are getting the education, uh, sorry, environmental diplomatic leader education program in the graduate course, uh -huh. including the master course and PhD course. Okay. So they all uh, expected to be an environmental diplomatic leader. And uh, if the objectives of the environmental diplomatic leader seems to be a, a leader or human resource, which can solve the environmental problems in each region or yeah. countries and or global yeah. scale, then the, one of the most important talents uh, seems to be uh, uh, the, well, yeah, of course, such kind of talents that, that something uh, balancing feeling or something. So anyway, that the <laughs> leaders <laughs> should understand every aspect. Yeah. They're very different together. So, for example, sta uh, the feeling of the stakeholders and yeah. the yeah. Uh, feeling of the uh, bureaucrat yeah. and the feeling of the, the policy making uh, so, or, or something. Yeah. However, if the leaders uh, feel too deep for or understand too deeply or, or for, for, the, for, the, for each stake for this, they cannot decide nothing. Yeah, parallel. Parallel. <laughs> so could you please, yeah, based on your experience yeah. for the minister, yeah. Yeah. could you please, if there is a kind of uh, uh, the standard of the, such kind of balanced feeling, uh, uh, okay, could you please it's, okay, it's like this. Uh, again, like with leadership, the question that you asked, you know, it, you cannot say, okay, so and so by this procedure has come here and will become the leader. You don't know because that crisis comes and leadership comes out during times of crisis of how people are able to act and, you know, take everybody along with them, okay? Now, on this one, Slight aside, let me say, you have heard of IWRM, Integrated Water Resource Management, okay, so this, I'm a critic of it, by the way. Uh, it's been said that uh, if this IWRM concept had originated not in, uh, you know, wherever it was, Holland or somewhere, Wageningen or wherever it came from, if it came not from Europe but had come from East Asia, you know, whether Korea or Japan or China or Thailand or wherever, it would not be called IWRM. It would be called, somebody re remarked, uh, HWRM. And you say, what is H? H is harmonious water resource re management, you know. Not integrated. Integrated is too formal, too um, instrumental, too everything. Harmonious means, yeah, we know there is a problem. I mean, let us keep things in harmony and see how we move to the next stage. Okay. Now, in... My experience was that when I looked at, let's say, some of the more talented uh, sort of the bureaucrats who were able to solve problems, and I had to promote some and some I had to, you know, they were senior, but I said, okay, you wait and get somebody else. It made them really mad, you know. But in my judgment, when I was judging people, and I had to look first at the problem. I know that the problem is a wicked problem. It cannot be solved by normal, regular, bureaucratic, accepted procedures. Okay, that's the first thing. You look around to see which kind of people have the kind of understanding or capacity to solve them. And then what you look for is people who are, uh, it doesn't matter what they know. Uh, you know, if I were, when I was as a minister looking, I said, yeah, basically all of them have the right degrees and all of them have the right whatever it is, you know. So you really don't worry, worry about this thing. What you worry is, is this guy able to work with others? Is this guy able to look and, you know, take a bit of risk to examine options that are not traditional. And is this person able to step back if the criticism comes that he did not expect and say, okay, I put forth an idea, I understand this criticism, okay, now I take this back, now I'll come with another idea. So it is this kind of, uh, you know, capacity to look for innovativeness, but also the sense of mm. what is the harmony. I think that, that it's a feeling. I think it's an art. And that is why at this COP10 uh, biodiversity right. meeting, the Satoyama 
initiative. Right. And I thought it was very Japanese <laughs> and very interesting because it is all about this harmony thing, you know. It's, I first asked somebody to say, please, can you explain to me what the Satoyama initiative is? They explained something. I said, but you know, okay, come on, you know, but it's not something you can really put your finger on and say one, two, three, four, five, you know. It is, it is, it is a way of appreciating harmony and bringing it about. And I think it's a very, very Japanese way of doing things. Right. Right. HWRM, yes, that's what it is. Thanks, Vikram. Okay, so any other, okay, please. Thank you. I was uh, I was quite happy to uh, to hear about cultural theory. I have been I have been thinking what is it all about. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, make a sense uh, that that what what new things we can actually uh, come out of this theory uh, for our problem solving. The first is that we know that our our system is very complex. We we li we live in a system uh, which is highly complex and which has a very very strong adaptive nature. So basically, mm -hmm. it's, it's a adaptive complex system with multiple mm -hmm. uh, drivers and multiple stressors. Basically, mm -hmm. that that's the system we live mm -hmm. in. So to look at the problem, uh, I I quite uh, have agree with you that we can look at the problem from different uh, different angles, different views, mm -hmm. and sometimes even what is success or what is failure is a, is a very very contentious question. Uh, a couple of years back, I was working with uh, some of the colleagues, still I do, with the colleagues from the World Bank or, or, or the colleagues of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific. We, we struggled so much to define what is a, what is a best practice. We, we started with a, what is a success, what is, what is a failure, and simply we couldn't really agree on what is good best practices. We came down to work from best practices to good practices. We are not convinced. We came down to the word called lessons learned completely scrapping our whole idea yes. about best practice because because it all depends upon the viewpoint to which side you look, whether it's good or not. Actually, it's so it's, it, it's so clumsy, you know, it, it's, it's so difficult to really figure out that. But in that context, uh, given the fact that we can look the problem from different angles, uh, how new things the cultural theory can, can shed lights, uh, that's what I was thinking. So I could think at least three different uh, things during your presentation. The first thing is that cultural theory uh, for the policy applications help us to try to think out of the box uh, from the traditional way of thinking, you know, what, what market does, what government does, just, just think, think out of the box what to do. Second thing is that we have to have some kind of multi-angle you know, multi, multi perspective. We have to try to explore some of the things that, that you know, we don't do, you know, even actors or, or mm -hmm. the sources or, or, or the diamonds. And third is probably uh, you know, beyond our traditional way of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. We, which is kind of you know, inherited in, into our you know how to say policy making yeah. system, yeah. so isn't that very very obvious? Uh, yeah, sometimes. What, yeah. what I mean, what what additional uh, ah. it can say other than that? Uh, okay. I don't know. I don't know. Even yeah, my okay. question is sometimes right. what is obvious is really not done, and very often when you look at the major elegant failures, the obvious is not done, and you'd be surprised how much in policy making simple things that should have been done were never looked at. Uh, simple things were ignored, you know. So what cultural theory is saying is, by looking at um, things in this plural way, and also plural, just plural enough, we argue. There is something called parsimony, you know, uh, Occam's razor, you, you've heard all these philosophical concepts. Huh? It means that don't multiply your assumptions too much, you know. See if you can come with a theory that uses the minimum assumption and that is the best theory. That's what Occam's razor says. What cultural theory does is, just with these two discriminators, it's able to get four ways of organizing. Now, we have big problems in social science with uh, our great postmodernist friends, you know. The trouble with postmodernism is it's great for critique, great for deconstruction, great for everything. But you get a bunch of postmodernists and give them a problem, the only solution they will have is more deconstruction and more 18 months of field work, you see. Now, that doesn't help. Let's say if I'm a minister and I want to take a decision before the next budget or the session, I can't wait 18 months for more data. Decision making always happens under uncertainty, okay? Much of, uh, you know, the problems, if only people were listening, have already been stated. Like Brent Spar case that I gave you, you know. I mean, Greenpeace was upset that, you know, you dump things in the oceans and that cannot be done. Now, if you do a calculation, you say, how much is one rig in the Atlantic Ocean going to cause damage? Yeah, that's not the point. 
for those guys it was a violation of certain basic values you know you're you're, you're dumping on nature you know? now if they had listened to that voice before they would not have had the problem they listened afterwards and it went fine i'll give you one more example simple it's from unilever the multinational company uh, in the 80s sometimes in the 80s what happened was they brought out those fancy you know they call rim blocks you know, now you have different things, but in the toilet, you know, when you flush the toilet, you have this green liquid, you know, blue liquid swirling, okay. Those rim blocks were brought out by Unilever. At one point, one of their products was attacked by the German Greens, saying it has some chemical that is very harmful to the environment. Of course, Unilever came out a statement, oh, it's not our tests have shown there is no harm, usual stuff, you know, like Coca-Cola saying there's no pollution. I mean, usually they do that, okay. But somebody in Unilever, some senior person had the better thought, you know, they said, listen, I mean, this will not solve the problem because the German Greens are going to start boycotting our products and our sales will go down, you know, this is always there, you know. So while we know that there is no problem, let us not immediately attack those guys, but say we will, for the time being, for a few days of in, or week of investigation, we will withdraw the product. And if our tests show that nothing is wrong, we will... Of course, the Germans, the Greens were not satisfied, but at least the product was withdrawn for a while. Okay. With the full intention that they will be brought back afterwards and everything will be fine. Okay. In the meanwhile, what happened was within Unilever, they started looking and you know what they found? They found that in their lab, they had a product which had been developed, which was sitting there, you know, which did not have that chemical, which could be produced much more easier than the previous one that had that chemical. And that new product stored that perfume, you know, that smell, good smelling perfume, much better in the storage. Now, so they brought that product out, you know, and uh, everything was fine. Now, that would not have happened if the, green, the Unilever had not listened to the German Greens. Okay. Of course, when they came out of this product, they didn't give credit to German Greens. You know, they said they're doing it from the goodness of their heart and the brilliance of their mind, you know. So that's how it is. So what cultural theory is basically telling you in policy terms is, you will be surprised that what is obvious is not at all obvious in policy because the way ministries, governments and markets are determined, even Unilever, just to withdraw those products was a huge cost and nobody wanted to take that cost. You know, but they had to because the cost of a boycott would have been worse. Okay. So this is where the crisis came and this is where the actions were taken. But the solution in the end was so obvious, they had a product that was in the, sitting in their shelves ready-made they could have used but nobody it just didn't in the business environment come to fore so what cultural theory is subsequently what Unilever did was they reorganized themselves in a funny way to you know before a product went out into the market to have their different divisions attack it you know and so much so that somebody joked you know that they have so pluralized themselves that they should now call themselves not Unilever but plurilever you know but this is where that uh, argument is. So cultural theory, I think what it does is just enough broad. It's not so infinite as, Professor, you mentioned, that if there's so much data and everything is different from everybody else, you know, and I'm having this problem even in, uh, you know, in the UN, when they talk of cultural diversity in water, yeah, culturally diverse it is, but how diverse is diverse? From a policy point of view, I need to know. I cannot come with a statement saying that, oh, everything is different. You know, of course, how, you know, one tribe in Congo manages water is very different from how the Tibetans manage water in Tibet and how the, uh, you know, uh, somebody else manages water somewhere else. It's all different. You're all right, you know. But how different is different? How plural is plural? And cultural theory is saying, listen, it may be very, very plural, but these four patterns, you can, if you look carefully, you'll find it from Unilever, you know, right down to, you know, some, you know, very old primitive group in the Congo or uh, Brunei or wherever you are, you know, you will find these patterns. And those four patterns are better than just the two public-private partnership thing. And it's enough to give you policy leverage that gives you policy stability. That's what cultural theory's great value, I think, is. So, okay, so time seems to be a little bit uh, up recently. So, yeah, everybody would like to have some comments or questions, but sorry for that. Hmm. And uh, before closing his talk, uh, I would like to ask, ask you that, uh, again, yeah, you already have gave him the, some hints, hmm. uh, good ideas to all the audience. But uh, finally, again, I'd like to ask you to, to, to have, give uh, encouragement message the, to all 
through wishing to be uh, environmentally diplomatic leaders, young mm -hmm. scientists, please. Ah, okay. Uh, well, what can I say? The wise word from the guru. Huh? Uh, if you can come out of this program with, uh, you have your expertise, you have your skills, and there is, you know, a baggage of good skills and tools, whether it is in economics or whether it is in social analysis or whether it's in political analysis, whatever, technical, it always helps. But once you're out in the real world, you've got to apply them. And probably 50% of or even more of what you learn, you'll never apply. Quite possible. You know, as an engineer, I'll tell you, what I learned in hydropower engineering in Moscow, you know, and working in Nepal, I didn't even apply about 20%, I think. Then I went to Berkeley and uh, California and became a political economist, and I applied more of that, 60% of it, but still I think it's 40% of what I learned. But those things are valuable, and you don't know when you apply. When I started communitization of electricity, one of the triggering factors for me was the uh, United States uh, Jimmy Carter's law of called PURPA, Public Utility Regulation Act, which basically in the 70s, early 70s, he'd done that, and I had learned a bit about it, that he had allowed force the utilities to accept that any small hydro producer should buy electricity if they offer at avoided cost. This was a major change in the United States. You know, Before it was not, the utilities would never take them. You know, So I said, wait a minute, if we can do something like this in Nepal, it might help. And it took me a lot of time. This particular law that I brought in, it took me 27 drafts in six months. And the bureaucracy was cooperating only after the 16th draft. It was just get that bad, and I must be the only minister who read every word of every draft, you know. So I think the main message is that why all this helps, as you begin to apply it, if you apply it by taking as a diplomat the consideration that different people have different views, and those different views come from very, very different value systems, and that all of them are partly right and partly wrong, you might be in a position to frame some acceptable solution to all of them. And as long as you do that, you'll probably be su successful. So that's what I think would be the main. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your wisdom.